Gabrielle, what about, I'm trying to just bring all this together and, and you bring up so many different things for me, questions, conundrums, and I'm trying to just put myself into what I can imagine being quite a few different seats of the listener. Um, I believe what you said and have brought up many times mm -hmm. of our belief system of our diet is very important. Our belief system of the foodstuffs we eat, plant or animal yep. is very important. It is. And, it is. And we have the ability, the privilege to do that. And that plays a major role in our food relationship, um, happiness, all these things. But it makes me wonder, like, could a person be thinking now, like, I'm having to choose happiness and connection to my food choice over longevity. Can I have both? What do you mean? So if I'm choosing to decrease or even eliminate plant or excuse me, animal protein. Yeah, you can do it. And by, by, what, we've, can do by it. what we've been talking about, therefore it's, it's a choice of my own. Yeah. I'm happy about it yeah. for my emotional, mental, spiritual, religious clear. benefits. Yeah. In doing so, am I kind of trading the short game for nope. the long game? Nope. You just got to be really smart. And that means you need to supplement with plant protein powders mm. and you need to supplement with iron and you need to supplement with creatine and you need to supplement with omega-3s. You need to supplement with and be very conscious mm. of how you're getting your protein. Could you do it? A hundred percent. It requires dedication and discipline. And you're going to have to offset that with a bit more training. Mm. Can Trade it be training. done? Yeah. Okay. Can it be done? It can absolutely be done. And again, this is not about me. I was vegetarian for many years. Really? Yeah. So this is not about me being against vegetarianism or veganism. It is about having a transparent conversation mm -hmm. of what truly is healthy and what are the endpoints that we're measuring. Mm -hmm. And then people can decide. Mm -hmm. But what I won't stand for is a bunch of BS that the, is the mouse with the microphone confusing people mm -hmm. who are trying to do the, the right thing. What's up guys, I'm Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and I am so excited to be on Chase's show. Here is what you have to expect. Number one, I am going to shift your paradigm of thinking. You will no longer be fat centric, but you will be muscle centric. Number two, you are going to learn about the narratives of nutrition. And finally, number three, of course, most important, how to implement this new strategy into your health and wellness. Uh, see, the, you got the fun toy over there. Every once in a while, I'll grab that one. And I'll just do, do that guy. <laughs> and we're it. live. Right. Gabrielle, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm ready to be schooled, apparently. Yeah. I'm ready to be taken to school for nutrition, for muscle health, yep. all the things that you are an expert in. So please introduce yourself and what is your expertise? Of course. My name is Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and I'm a physician. And I founded the concept and the Institute of Muscle-Centric Medicine. Mm. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. and You're an osteopath by trade, right? I am an osteopath, okay. but I will say that I did a MD fellowship. Okay, that's right. At, um, uh, in geriatrics, mm. uh, obesity medicine, and what was the last one? Nutritional sciences. Mm. Yes. And Good I spread. Did that, yep, I did that at WashU in St. Louis. Mm. Um, and that was pretty amazing. And yeah. that is actually where the concept of muscle-centric medicine is born. Can you define that for us? What uh -huh. does that mean? It is the concept that muscle is actually the organ of longevity. Hmm. And it determines everything about how we age. And especially as we think about where we are now, the diseases of a Western society, hmm. we have what? Cardiovascular disease. We have Number one. cancer, hmm. especially as it relates to obesity. We also have obesity. Mm -hmm hypertension, Alzheimer's disease. So we have a slew of largely metabolic diseases and everybody attributes that to fat. I've heard that, yeah. Right? <laughs> once like, or twice a bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, once or twice yeah, all, the yeah. all the time. It is all about obesity. Mm -hmm. What if I told you that actually these diseases begin in skeletal muscle first? Begin, they begin there. Yeah. Really, how so? Well, hang with me here. Uh -huh. What if I told you that we are not over fat, but we are actually under muscled 
and insulin resistance, mm. metabolic diseases start in skeletal muscle first. Wow. And then we get fat. Interesting. So you're kind of flipping this on its head a little bit. Yes. I think what is the common conception? The common conception is obesity is the root cause of everything. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. But the reality is, do we all of a sudden just become obese? Mm. No, we have processes in the body like mm -hmm. insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about skeletal muscle and skeletal muscle as the organ of longevity, then we must understand that it is responsible for the majority of the places where we put glucose. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. glucose disposal is skeletal muscle. Mm -hmm. Insulin resistance, and by the way, skeletal muscle makes up 40% of our body weight. For you, maybe 45, for me, maybe 35. <laughs> maybe 44, I don't know. We're getting there, we're getting there. But can you imagine if skeletal muscle was impaired? Mm. And that's actually where these issues start. So insulin resistance, one of the primary drivers is insulin resistance and skeletal muscle first. This brings me back to the concept of muscle-centric medicine. You were talking about something that was really ringing true for me. I was telling you I was a clinical health coach for yeah. many years and insulin resistance, those two, those two words mm -hmm. were probably the words that I would hear most out of the doctors I would work with when working with, we call them patients, you know, our clients. Right, of um, can you define that for us? Sure. Because it was very common for me in practice and it clearly must be very common for what you're working uh -huh. on and in society as a whole right now. Let's think about insulin. So insulin is a peptide, mm -hmm. right? And the role of insulin is to move glucose from the bloodstream into cells, right? And why it's is It's the that? sugar fairy. Like it's the sugar the fairy. The fairy, like on a boat, right? Exactly. And when we think about glucose, why do we have to move it out of the bloodstream is because glucose is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. We need it. And it's also highly toxic, right? Blood sugar is maintained when you are healthy at a very narrow range. Low blood sugar, we could define as say less than 70. Mm -hmm. High blood sugar, we can define as over a hundred. Mm -hmm. But the reality is blood sugar maintenance, very few things are, very few substrates as it relates to nutrition are maintained as tightly as glucose. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. it is interesting. Yeah. One other interesting aspect is we only have one mechanism to deal with elevated blood glucose. Yeah, one shot. We, and that is insulin. Mm. For hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, we have multiple mechanisms. So there are stress hormones that are released, there's glucagon, there's growth hormone, there's all kinds of things that we have to manage low blood sugar mm -hmm. and only one way to manage high blood sugar. Why is that? I believe that we are not meant to be dealing with Mm. issues of elevated blood sugar. So we kind haven't of, evolved to do that. The evolutionary kind of approach. Yeah, right? so we actually haven't evolved to do that. Right. So you asked me about insulin resistance, mm. and this is really the idea that we require more insulin to move glucose into the cell, right? And that makes sense, just, mm. you know, the verbiage of it, insulin resistance. And so the body pumps out more and more. Mm -hmm. Insulin resistance is really a problem, not just peripheral, peripherally, but also in the brain. And it's one of the reasons that we believe that Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease. Why are we kind type of three diabetes type of the three, brain, type yeah. three diabetes of the brain? Mm. Those become very important. So if we are to correct for all of these things, um, skeletal muscle is the site of glucose disposal. There we go. It is the largest site for glucose disposal. If we want to correct for insulin resistance, and not only that, the pathology begins in skeletal muscle, mm -hmm. largely. I mean, could you say it's 100% of the time in skeletal muscle that perhaps may be overstating things mm -hmm. because insulin resistance can begin in the liver. There's, there's other tissues. However, when we think about glucose regulation, we have to think about muscle. Mm. What if I told you that the paradigm of thinking for all of these years has been wrong. Really need to go back to the root source here. The root source yeah. isn't adiposity. Yeah. They have completely missed the boat. Which when you think about it, adipose tissue, fat, the when it, that becomes a problem is really because when we 
are letting go of muscle mass or we're not developing muscle mass. Or we're not we, maintaining not it. Not maintaining it. Skeletal yeah. muscles, you know, before we had no choice yeah. but to hunt for food. Before movement was not an option. Now it's an option. Mm. Now it's disposable. If you feel like you don't want to take the stairs, you can take the elevator. Mm. We have completely taken off the table mm. a biological need for movement. And by doing that, that really skews the way in which the organ of longevity, which is skeletal mm. muscle works. So my main message to all this technical jargon and to this discussion is that we don't have a body fat problem mm. that is secondary to the real issue, which is skeletal muscle. Now huh. you're going to be like, okay, well, that's great. What are we going to do about it? Right. And before we turned on the camera mm. and your amazing producer here will <laughs> uh, account for this, you said, I don't believe in any particular diet. Mm. And I said to you, by the time we are done, mm. you are going to think differently. I'm here for it. Okay, let's go. I'm here for it. Now, it's really interesting. Before we talk about diet, we have to talk about the idea of food science. Mm. Okay, hang with me here. Food. I need to start taking, taking some notes. <laughs> <laughs> there's food and there's science. And mm. food science is a term, you know, we think about nutritional sciences. Right, right. I didn't choose the word nutritional. I, choose, I chose the word food because food, interestingly enough, has an emotional component. Mm -hmm. my grandmother's cookies mm -hmm. actually she used to get these big like muffins that were low carb whatever it has a religious component uh -huh. it has a spiritual component it has a financial component mm -hmm. there are all these other things tied to food above and beyond the biological nutrients like the quantum or even meta component what, to exactly. a tangible thing we eat. It's so much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It is, it is not mm -hmm. in, it is not like, Oh, this is a bottle of water. It's, Oh my gosh, this water is in a plastic bottle and probably the plastics are ruining the ocean. And probably I'm going to find microplastics in my lungs. It's not just here's a cookie or here's a steak. Here's a steak. A phrase I say all the time on the show. I've never used it in this application, but the thing is never the thing. It's not the thing. That's amazing. That's not just a bottle of water. It's so much more that goes but into it. But we have, exactly. And as consumers, if we are unconscious, it's just mm -hmm. a bottle of water, but actually it's never that. Mm -hmm. So now we have food and then we have science. Now science, when you think about it, is reproducible. There are, you know, hypotheses that can be proven. There are multiple mm -hmm. people that can be working to do a certain goal. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a body of literature. The other thing with science is um, it's objective. Two plus two equals four. In physics, this is the physic al physics algorithm. In calculus, this is what it is. Mm. In biochemistry, this is what it is. And actually, in nutritional sciences, it is also what it is. Mm. You don't see, um, I don't know, discourse in people arguing about this physics versus this going to the moon here or do you... Physics are typically physics are typically physics. But you don't see people arguing yeah. about it. Right, you? right. Yeah. What we about have math? these math. truths. What about math? No. What about chemistry? Unless it's just me not being able to prove a formula. No. <laughs> Engineering? <laughs> no. Hmm. But nutrition is actually biochemistry. Mm. Do we argue about right. biochemistry? I see where you're going with this. But, and it's making me think. But we argue about food science. Mm -hmm. Why is that? That is because of all those original concepts that I brought to you, which is what food is. Mm -hmm. It is religious. It is emotional. It is your grandmother's cookies. Wow. So now we must understand that what we are hearing is not necessarily science. It's 50% science and 50% emotion. You, you really think it's that even of a split? No. Uh. I think depending on the day and depending on the agenda, okay. it's 80, 20, baby. Wow. Wow. Okay. I like that. I like that. 80 BS, 20% <laughs> truth. Okay. Now the question then becomes, well, why is that? Mm. And there's a couple reasons. Number one is scientists can't see through their own biases. Sure. Which is only in nutritional sciences. Mm -hmm. Again, you're not seeing this in physics. 
you're not seeing this in any other hard science. Mm -hmm. This is not a soft science. Okay, that becomes very interesting. And it dates back to the 1800s. This is nothing new. Individuals have been arguing about nutrition for decades and decades. When we first really, correct me if I'm wrong, fully understood that there was science and chemistry, biochemistry behind the stuff we were eating, right? We, we could measure arguing it. it uh, arguing about it before ah. because it was religious. Oh yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, okay. Insanity, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Somehow it's been forgotten that those conversations and those things had happened. There were groups like Seventh-day Adventists. There were groups, you know, there were biblical Christians. There were, there were groups that had very strong influences mm. into what we ate and from an agricultural mm -hmm. perspective. Sure. So fast forward to, let's just kind of fast forward to World War II or actually go back, but I take it from the 1800s to the 1940s. Mm. And the reason I'm painting this rich history is because we cannot understand, and you're a vet, you, mm. we cannot understand the current or the future if we don't look backwards. Mm. And nutritional sciences is literally as controversial as religion. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And we are seeing this to the point where if we don't account and correct for it, the people that are going to suffer are going to be the people that don't understand. So what does history have yeah. to really teach us? So 1940s. So right now, when I say red meat, what do you think? First thing you think. Uh, First thing. Steak. Okay. I think what I eat. Bad probably. or good. Do you hear bad or good things in the media? Bad. First thing, you hear bad things. Um, when was the last time you heard something good in the media about steak? Usually when watching uh, Dr. Sean Baker grill somebody. Okay. Aside from, <laughs> I, aside from my friend, Sean, who, by the way, I love. Hi, Sean. He's been on before. Okay. I love the guy. Yeah. So you, the truth is you don't hear anything positive mm -hmm. about red meat. What about protein? Is that bad for your, is that bad for your kidneys? Uh, in, in excess. Yeah. No. Oh. What about um, for your bone? Hmm. Well, okay, you're, you're highly educated on this, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> pretend you, I'm gonna ask the producer. Protein good or bad for you? I guess it's good. Okay. Everyone thinks it's bad. <laughs> okay, the reality is people think red meat is bad for you. Right, yes. People think eggs are bad for you. People think cholesterol is bad for you. Mm -hmm. People think that red meat and cattle mm -hmm. are killing the planet. They're bad farming practices. We're hearing all this narrative. That's been on my radar a lot lately. The Now the concept of regenerative farming, because like you just said, okay. it's all bad. Okay. Uh, is it possible that it's all a distraction? Is it possible? Sure. Yeah, I think so. Is it probable? Mm. I'm going to argue it is probable if we have all these people arguing about what seems to be the thing that it's actually not. Hmm. 1940s, okay? So in, in the 1940s, during World War II, there was a, a thing called rationing that mm -hmm. happened where the reality is, which is gonna blow your mind, the average caloric, the average calories for rationing were 3,000, which is insane. Wow, wow. The average male was 143 pounds. And the average for him was 3,000 calories? And the average woman was 123 pounds. Um, and rationing was 3,000 calories, and that was, people were hungry. Mm. People were hungry. What they were given was one egg a week. It's on 3,000 calories. A lot of bread, a lot of grains, some milk and cheese. And people were encouraged to build victory gardens. They were encouraged to become vegetarian. Wow. In the 1940s. And they were encouraged to become vegetarian. Do you know why? I'm guessing here to save the meat for the soldiers. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm, that's so interesting. So there was some early recognition mm. that meat and animal products were really important. Mm. Do you know, now the average soldier was 143 pounds. That was the average male. How much protein do you think they were allotted for, rationed for? In grams? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <sighs> I would be impressed if they were given maybe like 60 grams a day. Hmm. That's interesting because 70 grams a day is what currently the average American female eats. Mm. They were given at least one pound wow. of wow. meat. 
I have found literature from the 1940s that accounted what they were giving the soldiers and an injured soldier would get 250 grams of protein a day. Wow. And they reported that they saw an increase in healing. It was 50% faster than when they weren't. It totally, I totally had it backwards. I was, well, I mean, it makes sense Wait, now you're saying that it was allocated for the soldiers and like in such a high But that's so confusing need, but, because nowadays yeah. we hear that we should go vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost as if, it's curious because it's almost as if there are no self-imposed rationing. Mm. And the idea was using food as leverage to create patriotism. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You are going to build a victory garden. Mm -hmm. You are going to send your meat overseas mm -hmm. to feed those friggin' soldiers. And mm -hmm. the 2 million people we had to feed. Buy your war bonds, grow your vegetables. Exactly. Yeah. Eat more grains. Mm -hmm. So the food industry started really, you know, revved it up. Agriculture really revved it up to feed the people, which by the way, they were, uh, I think it was like 9% of, uh, of draftees they couldn't even use. Really? Wow. Because they Why? were so malnutrition. So frail. Yeah. yeah wow. Here. Damn. Basically, in the 1940s, we determined how important red meat was, how important animal products were. So important that we were sending it to our soldiers. The people that were going to defend the world. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, on the same hand, the same narrative exists about becoming more vegetarian, okay? At that time, they were given rationing books mm -hmm. and they were given, they were spoon fed, no pun intended, patriotism. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 80 years, the message is different. Very. But the recommendations are the same. Do you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? The recommendations nowadays Go more vegetarian. Don't eat meat. Mm. I'm going to package it in a way that mm -hmm. it's morally bad that you're eating that steak. Not that we're sending it to the soldiers, mm -hmm. but yeah, gotcha. it is the same food recommendations wrapped up in a different narrative. Isn't that odd? And the question is, who benefits? Mm. Because I will tell you, we have half a century of data that supports high, higher protein diets. And it's not a matter of opinion. Amino acids are amino acids are amino acids, and we're gonna get to that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to set the stage for the current narratives that we have now. Meat was never the bad guy. Mm -hmm. It is very curious to me that now policy, agenda, is dropping self-imposed rationing. Mm. Don't you find that curious? Very. And how is Very. it that, but if we're all arguing about all yeah. the other stuff, we will miss that. We will miss that we are seeing a circle back of 80 years ago mm. of control. Whoever controls the food controls the people. It's almost like this invisible label, invisible wrapper on everything, especially if you're looking at a, a protein source, a meat yep. protein source, it's like, what really am I looking at here? What, what is this product coming wrapped in or not wrapped yeah. in? It's, um, wow. it's pretty scary and it's very interesting. So the narrative, and then, you know, there are certain governing bodies that manage commodities, mm -hmm. right? So the USDA and there's, you know, the, the federal trade commission and the FDA can, can, you know, manage the other ones, but, or do manage the other ones. But if something is a commodity, which means it is a kind of a whole food that mm -hmm. is unpackaged like beef mm -hmm. or eggs or dairy, they actually have restrictions on what kind of health claims that they can make. Right. Yeah. They can only say, you know, meat is part of a healthy diet where you can get processed food companies because they are under a different jurisdiction and a different restriction can say whatever they want. Impossible burger is the next best thing. Save your environment. But a ground beef company couldn't say the same thing they, about their patties. They can't say anything. They can't say anything. They can't even defend themselves. Hmm. My whole point in bringing this up is to say that the conversation that we are hearing is not a balanced conversation. Mm -hmm. 
So then how do we balance it? What, what can be done if well, the people running the organizations can, can't even can, say there anything? Is the only thing that we can do is we can have transparent conversations. Mm -hmm. And that is what I'm trying to provide for you. My goal is to provide you and your audience with a transparent conversation. I'm kind of hearing two different conversations or two tracks mm -hmm. coming off of what you just shared. Thank you. Of course. Very informed, very um, powerful. And one is the history, this invisible wrapper, so to speak, of what is being yeah. said or not said in our food choices. And I think the whole concept behind the food industry and bureaucracy behind that is nothing new. Um, but this is right. a pretty intense new light, at least for me. Yes. But then two is really what we're missing here is the whole, you know, beyond that aspect, it's the necessity for protein and for lean muscle Absol tissue. Absolutely. So it's, it's kind of like, can we work with both at the same time or do we need to attack or navigate one? You know, how do we get both of these yeah. to kind of cooperate? Let's um, dive into that, shall we? Please. You are absolutely correct. There are two components to this conversation. Number one, it's the back history. Mm -hmm. And number two, moving into the hard science of it. And that is arguably what is non-negotiable. Right. Now, let's look at protein. And when we talk about protein, we are talking about a substance that has amino acids. Mm -hmm. And there are 20 amino acids. Nine of those are essential mm -hmm. and the rest our body can make. When they are essential, the nine that are essential means we must eat for those amino acids. Got to get them in our food stuff. We the body have to doesn't get them in. Them. We, we must. Yeah. And when we think about protein, there's animal-based proteins and there are plant-based proteins. From a logical perspective, the makeup of each of those are different. Mm. And one of the reasons that they are different, and they both have all the amino acids for the most part, mm -hmm. um, it's just they have them in, to varying degrees. Right, yeah. And the difference between animal-based proteins and plant-based proteins really come down to the essential amino acids, which is why we eat. In particular, when we are talking about essential amino acids for muscle health, it is the branch chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. You're talking uh, for maybe the listener who's yeah. heard this other term, complete versus non-complete proteins. Yes. Complete yes. meaning has all the yes. essential amino acids are non-complete, which correct me if I'm wrong. Again, a lot of plant protein sources are, are non-complete. Yes. Right. And okay. also are low in the amino acids that we need for health. Right. Now, We've all heard of the RDA, mm -hmm. which is a recommended dietary allowance, and that is set at 0.8 grams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. That is based on nitrogen studies, which means it looks at whole body nitrogen turnover. Mm -hmm. That was also very crude. Mm -hmm. And since that time, we, at that point in time, when we had learned that, when I say we, I wasn't even close to being born, it was really based on a transition from animal husbandry. Mm. It's okay. funny you mentioned this literally just last week. We yeah. had uh, the the godfather of nitric oxide in here. Dr. Mm. Louis Ignaro was in kind of sharing cool. his original studies about all this. Amazing. Yeah, full circle. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nitrogen balance really was, um, uh, it was taken from animal husbandry. And it was this idea of how do we grow animals mm -hmm. in the cheapest way? And that means higher, yeah. what, high carbohydrates and what's the minimal amount of protein that we can utilize to actually have these animals grow. Just to keep them alive, to grow, to grow. lower overhead. You know, exactly. It's a business model. Exactly. So that the, that is how they looked at nitrogen balance. Really, it was the minimum. And that's how they then translated that over to the RDA. Mm. And one of the things that they looked at was soldiers, because that's who we were, typically younger men, uh, 25 or less. Yes, yeah, so right? like 18 to 25, yeah, yeah. probably young, back then. Yeah. Young men, and it was very yeah. crude. And this was the minimum to prevent deficiencies, mm. which we have not changed. <laughs> now, now the RDA is a recommended, and I'm going somewhere with this because it doesn't take into account the quality of the protein. Right. We haven't even touched on quality. We're just yeah. talking source. Right. Yeah. And we're just saying that, oh, you need 0.8 grams per and, kilogram. In total, yeah. Right. And the average female gets about 75 grams of protein. The average male gets about 90 grams. Mm. Ouch. And I'm going to tell you why. Mm. When we think about um, the RDA for vitamin C, which is set at 60 uh, milligrams of vitamin C, when you feel sick, do you take more vitamin C? 
Yeah. So you're essentially telling me that the RDA for vitamin C is the minimum. Mm. You are, right? Mm. And that when you're sick or maybe you feel a cold coming on or something is wrong, you take more vitamin C. Mm -hmm. And you might take 5,000 milligrams. Yeah, usually up there, honestly, I just grab a handful of my C or, you know, a couple oranges or whatever. Do you think twice about it? No. Why is it that the RDA for protein at 0.8 grams per kilogram, we are hearing and people think of as the maximum? Yeah. Why is that a threshold? Why is it that people are arguing and saying, oh, no, I've got my 0.8 grams per kilogram. That's enough. But how does that make sense? So why is the unconscious dichotomy hmm. so prevalent? Wow. It is because of a narrative that we didn't even realize existed. Yeah. Yeah. This is new for me. So now we think about 0.8 grams per kilogram of the um, protein intake, which is the minimum to prevent Deficiency. Right. I was going to ask you, why are we saying minimum here? It's just to That's, prevent other yeah. health defects. Yeah. Yes. Anything. And also to support protein turnover, right. anything, right? So protein is, we always hear about protein as the building blocks. Mm -hmm. Now the RDA doesn't talk about the quality of protein really directly in that way, nor does it talk about the amino acid threshold, mm -hmm. which is ultimately what is the most valuable as we age. Um, you know, Kevin Tipton or... Bob Wolf mm. or uh, Don Lehman or Stu Phillips. The, are, there are many, many, Heather Lighty. There's many of the top researchers that have done randomized control trials of these things. This is not a nebulous concept. So anyway, um, we're going back to that 0.8 grams per kilogram. So what does the data actually show? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in all, I am not aware of one study that would say something less mm. than 0.8 grams per kilogram is going to be beneficial for survival or for any measurable health outcome. Mm. But that is what we are hearing. That is the message that we are hearing from longevity experts. Mm. So we have now established in a very crude way that nitrogen balance studies will give us the bare minimum. Interesting. So the bare minimum is 0.8 grams per kilogram. And actually in the early literature, in, I was looking at a 1972 WHO Geneva convention, just mm. huge stuff, just huge, uh, you know, where they were conferencing and they were talking and, oh, yeah. and this was from the beginning. And they were talking about how they underestimated protein needs by at least 20%. 20%. At least 20%, which we have now seen fast forward in the literature. We know that as you age, you need at least... 1.6 grams per kilogram, nearly double the RDA. Mm. And it's not just aging, right? And this is now to improve health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yet, if we listen to the narrative, we are being encouraged to go more plant-based. Nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. Again, I bring it back to the question is number one, who profits? And number two, show me one randomized controlled trial that says a lower protein diet is going to help a health outcome. I haven't seen any. In fact, in every study that I have seen, one gram per kilogram beats out 0.8 grams. Mm. I've never seen something less than 0.8 grams per kilogram do, you know, better, right? It, so, so like 0.7 grams per right. kilogram, 0.3 grams per kilogram, in a human study, we are not talking about mice, which by the way, they are, that is, that's a whole other problem. Mm -hmm. So we must ask ourselves, well, what does the evidence show? Well, the evidence shows that 0.8 grams per kilogram is the bare minimum. And now I'm going to talk to you about the quality of protein and, and where and how we need to think about that. Quite frankly, animal protein and plant protein are different. Mm -hmm. That's it. Bottom line. And this is really based on the amino acid profile. One of the things that if we go back to our original discussion was muscle-centric medicine. Mm -hmm. Muscle is the organ of longevity, truly. It determines your metabolic capacity. And I'm not just talking about your metabolism, but it's a place for glucose disposal. It is a place for fatty acid mm -hmm. oxidation. It is a place, it is your body armor. Mm -hmm. It is what is going to protect you if you get injured, which you've had injuries, you've mm -hmm. had to recover. Mm -hmm. The more muscle mass you have, 
the greater your chance of survivability. Where in health and wellness can we say nearly 100% of the time you will do better if you have healthy skeletal muscle? Mm -hmm. Your outcomes for nearly every disease process Mm -hmm. will be improved if you have healthy skeletal muscle and are fit. Yet, we continue to talk about obesity. Yeah. So what do we need to do from a practical standpoint for the coach or the entrepreneur or the stay-at-home mom who is listening? Well, we need to optimize for protein first. And if you are going to go plant-based, can you do it? Yes. If you are going to choose to use quinoa as your protein, I just want to tell you it's going to take six cups of quinoa to equal one small chicken breast. I can't even touch six cups of quinoa. That's You would get fat. <laughs> Forgive me, but you would turn into a, a fatty lot. patty. Yeah. And I apologize, yeah. but it's true. Yeah. Okay. So now- That's really confusing because we're being told that if we eat high quality protein, Mm -hmm. like, you know, red meat, which by the way, red meat consumption is down 30% since the 1970s. Wow. Wow. But, you know, I will just say also that 70% of our diet is already Mm -hmm. plant-based. Did you know that? No, I did not. Seven, according to the Anna Haynes data, 70% of our diet is already plant-based. 70% of the typical American diet. Yeah. Wow. It's already plant-based. Hmm. Um, so just throwing that out there to talk about how we, you know, so going more plant-based. You but really have to go hunting, no pun or pun intended, to get your protein then. If you this just got to be wise point. now. So there, w- again, what people are hearing is the narrative is skewed. Hmm. It is the mouse with a microphone. The reality hmm. is, can you be vegetarian and be healthy? Yes. My question is, are you being vegetarian because you are trying to do good for the world? Which, hmm. by the way- That's Mm. not a good strategy. Or are you vegetarian because you're interested in animal rights? Mm. If that, you know, if it is a moral issue, then I understand. But if we are talking about health, there is nowhere in the data that are high quality randomized control trials that would support that behavior. Now, what do we need? So from my research, from the research of giants, right? And I am a physician. I am trained as a geriatrician, nutritional sciences, obesity Mm. medicine. I did seven years of professional nutrition training. Shoot me in, you know, like, oh my God, I don't recommend that for anybody. (laughs) It's a hell of a background. It's a lot. You know your stuff. Well, yes, but I also have been trained by a world leading protein Mm. expert with no biases, Mm. who just cares about making an impact in science. It's the best. Which is really interesting. Mm. Um, I recommend, and this is on the higher end, one gram per pound ideal body weight. Okay. Which has always been my kind of recommendation as well. And And personal choice. Yes. Could you go lower? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you go higher? You also could. And when we think about aging and we think about health, we have to think about, okay, so if this person is, is recommending one gram per pound, ideal body weight, what, what does that mean? Well, Mm -hmm. that's typically in a 24 hour period. Right. Right. Now, as you age, and this is where things get missed is that there are, there is an amino acid requirement per meal to protect your muscle as you age. So beyond just the protein quality and count in terms of grams there source, is, yes. it's that much deeper in an amino acid breakdown. Which is actually what is completely missing from the huh. current recommendations. Yeah. This is news for me. So when you think about amino acids, like the essential amino acids, and when you think about muscle health, you think about the branch chains. Mm-hmm which is leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Leucine is a very, very important stimulus for Mm. this, um, you know, protein complex called mTOR, Mm. okay? So you must stimulate mTOR to get subsequent muscle protein synthesis, Mm. okay? When you eat sub threshold to say two and a half grams of leucine. And I know that this is like, people are like, well, well, how do I even know? I'll get there, I promise. When you eat sub threshold to two and a half grams of leucine as you age, you do not stimulate muscle. Really? Really. So, well, hold on. So we could be, for all intents and purposes, on our path to consuming the right amount for us, this gram per pound of protein. That's right. But we could still be missing the mark. Well, um, I don't want to say yes. In reference the, to this branch chain amino acid. So this 24 about. hour, pro, the, the data would suggest that the 24 hour protein intake is really the, the primary okay. component. However, as you age, 
your muscle has this physiological process that happens called anabolic resistance. Mm -hmm. What that means is the efficiency of your muscle decreases. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, I don't care about that. That's so stupid. What am I gonna do about it? Well, you will care, trust me, when you get in your thirties, <laughs> you, do, you do care. <laughs> yeah, I know a thing or two about that. Anyway, yep. I'm just kidding. Um, what happens is, is you must compensate for that decrease in mm -hmm. efficiency of skeletal muscle. Well, what does that mean? That means that you really need a minimum of 30 grams of protein, mm -hmm. which is more like if you really wanted to optimize to 50 at an individual meal. 50 grams of dietary protein per meal. Yes. We're assuming three meals per day. Well, we can get there. Okay. Um, it could be two. It depends on what your goal is. Okay. Right. But if you do not change your eating patterns and you eat the way that you did when you were 20, when you're mm -hmm. just eating like these small meals and you're always sub threshold, maybe you're getting 15 grams of protein, mm -hmm. you will never optimize body composition with that strategy. And I shouldn't wow. say never, that is very extreme, but as an aging, if you are an aging individual, which, you know, God willing, we all are, you must protect skeletal muscle. Mm -hmm. And the way in which you do that is yes, you do resistance training. However, mm -hmm. mechanistically, you need to hit that leucine threshold. And that's at two and a half grams of leucine. Where does that come from? I'm so glad you Where asked. Where does that come from? It comes from, you know, four ounces, roughly 30 to 35 grams of dietary protein, which is about four ounces of beef. Okay. At one meal. Five ounces, you're at 35 grams, you're covered. Okay. I mean, that's at the minimum. Now you're like, well, what if I go plant-based? Because mm -hmm. I just told you that it's not just a protein requirement. It is, but it it is about a 24-hour period, but we have individual amino acid requirements that are individual meal requirements to stimulate the organ of longevity, mm -hmm. muscle. That means if you are going to do a protein feeding, you are going to eat, you need a minimum of 30 grams of protein, upwards of 50 at a meal, ideally minimum two meals a day. You Which want, for a good reference for people is usually about like the size of your fist. Probably right? a little bit more. Ish, yeah. Probably a little bit more. Yeah. And it needs to be high quality protein. Mm -hmm. If it's not high quality protein, you could throw in. So if you are, if you skew more towards veg vegan or vegetarian, then you would need to use an amino acid, mm -hmm. uh, like a branch chain amino acid scoop with it. Now, what about you say quality? Are we talking like traditional beef versus like grass fed beef? I don't you know, care. Where do we, where I do we don't get there? care. Mm -hmm. And do you realize- Just as long as it's a plant, or excuse me, an animal beef complete. And yes, it's a complete protein. Complete. And with the correct, um, in the correct amount. Mm. There is this idea that all conventional beef is bad. I totally don't agree. I don't agree. The so conventional versus organic yeah, versus grass fed. I don't fed. agree. Oh, okay. I don't agree with that. Why is that? I'm going to tell you. Um, well, first of all, the amount of land that we can actually graze cattle is minuscule. Mm -hmm. Right. So if a big piece of paper is the earth, cut that in half, that's like the amount that you can actually do any kind of like that's the land mass. And then you cut that into like a business card and then cut the business card in half. And this small amount is the amount that you can actually. Damn, if that's not a visual for you. That that's actually the amount that you actually can graze cattle on. And I heard that's even getting smaller. I was sharing with you earlier, kind of what's on my radar now, a little bit more about regenerative, regenerative yeah. farming is that's that even that is going away in just a few decades. I mean, that sucks. And I can't take credit for my visual. That's Frank Mitlahaner, who mm -hmm. is a world wow. leading expert in greenhouse gas and in uh, agriculture in cattle in the, you know, climate change. He is a world leading expert. So that makes it very real. Yes. Very real. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is not just, Oh, I read this in the guardian, Yeah, you know, or I read this in the Washington post. It's no, there are experts mm -hmm. out there that um, are good light posts. So anyway, mm -hmm. the amount of land that we actually can graze cattle, I think it's probably very hard to graze cattle in, I don't know, Florida marsh. Right. Like that's kind of iffy. It might be really hard to graze cattle in, um, I don't know, the deserts of Arizona. Mm -hmm. So conventional um, versus organic. Well, number one, unhappy, unhealthy cows don't grow. Brings it full circle to what we were talking about, our state of being when we're picking a product, the religious, the mental, the emotional. But unha unhappy cows yeah. don't grow. Yeah. Not only that, 
cows graze 60% of their life, whether they are conventional Mm. or not. Whether a cow is conventional, grass-fed, organic, the majority of cattle spend 60-some percent of their life grazing. Mm. And people are like, oh, they're in crowded you know, environments. Well, there's bad practices in everything, but the reality is they are herding animals. Mm-hmm. They herd together. So if they're you do it anyway. let them out on an open pasture, they are going to crowd together. Mm. I mean, these are just logical things. And- you know, again, uh, do I love regenerative agriculture? Absolutely. Do I feel that we should cost prohibit people from eating high quality animal sources when we know that animal sources of protein have mm. a bioavailable iron, which, you know, mm. 40% of women and children are deficient in mm. iron. It's one of the biggest issues, right? The idea that we would go vegetarian or vegan or that we should stop eating red meat is an absolute privilege Mm. and Mm -hmm. a luxury Mm -hmm. and the rest of the world doesn't feel the same way meaning they find it is a privilege to be able to have the foods that we have oh yeah so the arguments that we're having i don't know if they're just complete distraction Mm. to a much bigger picture that people are wanting us to reduce meat consumption because there's new technology Mm. and certain people of power own the technology to make fake meat. But meat is a nutrient dense source of food that we've been eating for 2 million years. And it is a privilege. Mm. And I, it amazes me when we are sitting here in the U S saying, Oh, just, we should eat less red meat. That's so rude. You know, my husband, my husband's a seal deployed to Africa, deployed to Afghanistan. He's deployed all over. And he, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm speaking for him, but um, he's amazed at the poverty and the inability to consume and, and, Mm. and any of those things. Right. And then we come back here and we're like, ah, I just had my fruit smoothie, Mm -hmm. you know, eating meats, eating meats bad for the planet and all this stuff. For the vast majority of Americans, I'll make the statement that I think our choice in what we eat is one of the greatest privileges we have. It is. I mean, that's, you know, unfortunate situations all over the U.S., food deserts, poverty. Uh, yes, but, but still, yes. for the vast majority of us, it's like whatever I want to go eat, my choice is a, is a big privilege. It is a big privilege. And the reality is high quality protein is healthy. And it's mm-hmm. going to be the thing that helps optimize for longevity. It's going to be the thing that's going to protect you if you fall. Mm-hmm. If you fall and break a hip, which you won't, right? But if you did or your mom did- Mine have already been busted twice, so we're good. (laughs) It's a death sentence. Yeah. If an individual gets cancer, you know what many of those people die from? Cancer cachexia. It's a Mm. muscle-wasting disease. Mm. So while everybody is arguing about all this other stuff that isn't even accurate, by the way, uh, when it comes to global warming- It is a highly complex, not black and white issue. Mm -hmm. And nearly 80 some percent of greenhouse gas or any of these issues are related to industry, Mm -hmm. electricity, and transportation. Do you know how much agriculture in the U.S. plays a part? So because we shouldn't eat meat because it's bad for the planet, 9%. Mm -hmm. Of that 9%, do you know how much actually contributes uh, to uh, cattle farming? I don't know. I think it's 3%, maybe less. Nothing. So if everyone were to stop eating meat and have like a meatless Monday, I think it might change something by 0.2%. But what are you going to eat instead? A bunch of carbohydrates? Processed foods. So who benefits? Who benefits? Where does the money go? So it makes me think, you know, let's go down this rabbit hole of what you're saying of who benefits here. So if one side is benefiting, the the non-protein side uh, or the less they're not benefiting. Side. They're, they are not benefiting for health reasons. I was going to say, so then, then what is the agenda? Who is making money? Hmm. What is the goal also then? So if, if there's agenda of money, the goal after making money is what to, to keep animal us weak? rights. Uh, probably. Hmm. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but quite I mean, literally weak. Um, yes. I mean, in the Roman times, I mean, meat was a sense of, it was a sign of power. It mm-hmm. was a sign of masculinity. It was a, it was, you know, the wealthy, it was strength. 
you know, if, if someone were to look at the history of meat consumption over a period of time, this is what they would find. And salt, you know, going back that far, you know, yeah. that's I don't know anything that's about salt. I don't now. know anything about salt. Mm-hmm. I can only speak for, you know, sorry, it's getting hot in here. Yeah, you're good. So Just kidding, guys. It's getting all warmed up. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, sodium is another thing that's been, you know, kind of demonized yeah. over the years. It's, I can't help with that. It's, but it's incredible. We've had Rob Wolf on the show to talk he's at length about I, that. I love Rob. You know, I use Element every day. Okay. The, his work on sodium and electrolytes has been great. transformative. Great human. Um, yeah. So when we think about high quality protein, and again, I am not saying you cannot be vegan or vegetarian. Mm-hmm. I am just saying why. Mm-hmm. And if it is for health reasons and environmental reasons, it is incorrect. Okay. It's just not, that's not a good enough reason. If it is for emotional, it is for reasons of things other mm-hmm. than the physical health. I can understand that. And not only that, we shouldn't be at odds, Uh right? So it's interesting. I am portraying this way of it being at odds, Mm -hmm. plant versus animal. It's not. It's about having a transparent conversation. Mm -hmm. If we can have a transparent conversation, then we can make decisions with eyes wide open. And right now, that is not happening. You know, so I'm a trained geriatrician, which means I've had the privilege to work at nursing homes and I have the privilege to be by more dying people than you can imagine, nor do I wish to account, Mm. right? This is the end of their life. One of the biggest thing, biggest things that kill these people is their ability to recover from illness. Mm. They do not have the muscle, they do not have the capacity They have not been taught well. And if we continue to be fat focused, agricultural centric, we will never save lives. Mark my words, we will have the same conversation about obesity Mm. and wondering why we are not solving these problems for the next 50 years. By focusing on protein and muscle, we could and will in fact solve obesity. Are you kidding? We'll solve obesity. We'll solve metabolic dysfunction. Sarcopenia, which is going to be inevitable for the Mm -hmm. large majority of us, which now we are seeing is starting, which is a loss of strength and, Mm -hmm. you know, muscle strength, function and size. Plus frailty at end of life. We're going to, we start, we're starting to see that in people's Mm thirties. Sarcopenia is no longer a disease of aging. We must correct for the conversation. Dietary protein is important. Do I have the answer in terms of, is there a way to blend the two plant and animal? Mm. I'm sure, right? Again, agriculture is a very complex topic, yet we continue to make it very black and white. But I will have to say, dietary protein is the elephant in the room. Mm. It is the black sheep of the macronutrient family. And we are hearing from people to say, oh, increases the risk of cancer. By what mechanism of action? Mm. What mechanism of action? mTOR? you increase mTOR by resistance training. But what they're not telling you is if you're worried about mTOR, then you better be worried about your small carbohydrate meals because what increases mTOR more in every other organ? Excess carbs, Mm -hmm. excess insulin. Dietary protein is very specific to skeletal muscle. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle, what about, I'm trying to just bring all this together and and you bring up so many different things for me, questions, conundrums, and I'm trying to just put myself into what I can imagine being quite a few different seats of the listener. Um, I believe what you said and have brought up many times Mm -hmm. of our belief system of our diet is very important. Our belief system of the foodstuffs we eat, plant or animal is very important. It is. It is. And we have the ability, the privilege to do that. And that plays a major role in our food relationship, um, happiness, all these things. But it makes me wonder, like, could a person be thinking now, like, I'm having to choose happiness and connection to my food choice over longevity. Can I have both? What do you mean? So if I'm choosing to decrease or even eliminate plant or excuse me, animal protein. Yeah. You can do it. And by by what we've by what we've been talking about, therefore it's it's a choice of my own. Yeah. I'm happy about it. Yeah. For my emotional, mental, spiritual, religious clear. benefits. Yeah. In doing so, am I kind of trading the short game for nope. the long game? Nope. You just got to be really smart. And that means you need to supplement with 
plant protein powders mm -hmm. and you need to supplement with iron and you need to supplement with creatine and you need to supplement with omega threes. You need to supplement with and be very conscious mm -hmm. of how you're getting your protein. Could you do it? A hundred percent. It requires dedication and discipline. And you're going to have to offset that with a bit more training. Mm -hmm. Can Straight it be training. done? Yeah. Okay. Can it be done? It can absolutely be done. And again, this is not about me. I was vegetarian for many years. Really? Yeah. So this is not about me being against vegetarianism or veganism. It is about having a transparent conversation mm -hmm. of what truly is healthy and what are the endpoints that we're measuring. Mm -hmm. And then people can decide. Mm -hmm. But what I won't stand for is a bunch of BS that the, is the mouse with the microphone confusing people mm -hmm. who are trying to do the, the right thing. I, let me tell you a story. I was doing my fellowship at WashU and part of the responsibility is I was a combined uh, research fellow and medical fellow, mm -hmm. which most people who after medical school or after residency go to do a medical fellowship. I actually did something different. I did a dual fellowship, which mm -hmm. combined research for two years with combined clinical practice for two years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I bet you had a lot of free time during that time, huh? <laughs> no free time. And one of the things I had the privilege of doing was working with participants. Mm. Working with participants and one of the big studies that I was working on, which was called the LID study, which ended up, uh, components of it were published, but the mm. big, the big uh, paper has not yet been published, was looking at the interface between obesity and brain function. Mm. Again, I was a geriatrician, I'm a geriatrician by training, which is cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, which if you or your listener has ever encountered someone with dementia, it is heartbreaking, mm -hmm. heartbreaking. And this woman, she was a mom of three and she was in her, she might've been in her early fifties, post-menopause. And I imaged her brain and she was the woman, she was so sweet, three kids, always jolly, always taking care of everybody else, stay-at-home mom. And I imaged her brain, I did an fMRI, we, did, we were doing fMRI studies of her brain and her brain looked like an Alzheimer's brain. At about what age again? Early 50s. Wow. Jeez. And I was like, oh my God, you know? Um, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, in the next 30 years, I knew what the end of her life was going to be like. Mm. She, 10 years was in the next 10 years, where did I put my keys? I, I can't mm. quite remember. She wasn't going to know what was, you know, going to happen. It's kind of like, you know, when you've got a kid and, and you're watching your kid, you know, and you're watching your kid do a silly thing and you know how that's going to end. <laughs> so I was watching her, you know, and like looking at these images going, oh, my God, we as a medical society failed her. Mm. She was that woman that was constantly could never lose that 20 pounds, yo-yo dieting her whole life, always obsessed, weight watchers, always obsessed with body fat never focused on skeletal muscle, had very little muscle and complete metabolic chaos. Mm. And it wasn't because she wasn't trying. We failed her. I failed her. Through misinformation. Through misinformation. Right. Spending decades talking about fat. Not saying, hey, you know, we really need to improve your muscle mass. If we improve your muscle mass, we're going to improve your insulin resistance. We're going to improve your blood pressure. We're going to give you dietary protein because dietary, high quality dietary protein has arginine in it, which is a precursor for NO2. And you're going to get branching amino acids, which are going to stimulate muscle. Mm. Instead, underneath it all, as a medical society, we failed her. So that is actually where muscle-centric medicine was born. Mm. Wow. And I bring this up and I don't know why I got off on this tangent. I just wanted to tell you the story about yeah, wh how are we interfacing now going back to the listener who's like, oh my God, now I'm totally confused. I was vegan and vegetarian and now I don't know what to do. And I will say, you know what? In your 20s, go right ahead. Mm. In your 20s, you want to be vegan and vegetarian. Go, I was. Go ahead. As you age, we must understand that we filter the information. Mm. You filter the information that you're hearing on the internet or the mass media and just kind of push that off as entertainment. Mm. And then, then we can look at the science where we know 
We must eat 0.8 grams per kilogram. If you are going to do plant-based proteins, then you're going to need like 35% more mm -hmm. total protein, mm -hmm. which is okay. Just account for it in the calories. Mm -hmm. If you need, um, you know, just account for it, making sure you're not carbociding yourself. Mm -hmm. Be very diligent and smart, knowing that we're going to add branched chain amino acids. Again, I'm not giving anyone medical advice, but this is what I would be talking to my patients about. We're going to add in um, creatine. You're going to mm -hmm. add in some of the you know extra iron. You're going to add in high quality nutrients that you would only get from animal based products. Okay, so there's that. If you are a high quality protein eater, what are you going to do? You're going to go. Okay, so I need around one gram per pound ideal body weight. I'm hearing in the literature that, you know, I'm hearing in the media that I should reduce my consumption because it's bad for the environment, all this stuff. And I will say, you know what? I don't agree with that. Mm. And the evidence doesn't support that. So we're going to take that off the table. And how are you going to optimize? You're going to optimize by understanding that protein requirement is not just protein requirement. There is a meal threshold requirement. Mm -hmm. And as you get older, that becomes more important. And hitting a 30 to 50 grams of protein per meal is essential for muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. If you are sub threshold, it is not going to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. It's going to be like pregnant. You either are mm, or you're not. Yeah, yeah. Right? You either stimulate it or yeah. you don't. And a way to bring that stimulation back up is to add in a scoop of branched chains if you don't want to eat that much protein. But really understanding that protein is not just a 24-hour period, while that is the most important distribution matters mm -hmm. and understanding if you're looking for metabolic correction, you could do three meals a day optimizing for protein. If you are older and you want to maintain, then it's two very robust meals. And I don't care about that. That second meal. Mm -hmm. Those are very practical take homes. So the mm -hmm. big message in all this is number one, we're not over fat. Like, okay. Yeah. That's a symptom of a much greater problem, which is skeletal muscle. A byproduct of not enough skeletal yeah. muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Or unhealthy yeah, yeah. fat. Fat infiltrates into muscle. Mm. It, it looks like a marbled steak. Mm. That's not just for the cow. That's what happens to humans. Again, we are not required to move in the same way that we did. It is no longer a requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Are you familiar with the work? Sorry to cut you off. But yeah. just made me think of uh, Dr. Sylvia Tara, The Secret mm -hmm. Life of Fat. Mm -mm. Oh my gosh. Um, Probably would love it. Uh, unreal. Um, one of the, actually my very early guests on the show years ago, but just the whole concept of re-understanding of fat particularly brown fat, she brings up amazing concepts of woven in with muscle tissue and how yeah. important and necessary fat is at the right amount with proper amounts of muscle tissue. Yeah. yeah. She was probably ahead of her time. Mm. So, um, well, I definitely would check that out. Yeah. Secret life of fat. I'll link it down the notes for okay. everybody. Okay. You know, so, um, the, again, we have to change the paradigm of thinking mm -hmm. fat phobic, obsessed with fat. We need to be muscle centric. If we are muscle centric, we can change the trajectory of how we age. Mm. Can change the trajectory in, you know, I, I try not to talk about in absolutes because that's very difficult, but without a shadow of a doubt, we'll tell you that your survivability mm. will go up with healthy skeletal muscle. Mm. Okay, so then there's that. So number one, we corrected for the paradigm. Number two, we addressed the narrative. That the narratives are so robust, the mouse with the microphone, mm. we don't know what to think. And nutrition science is an oxymoron. Mm, okay. Number two. Mm. Number three, taking the emotion out of it, high quality protein and its sources are different. There's animals mm. and there's plants. Both are super important and different. Both can be utilized. However, we must understand that if people take away nothing else, that the way in which we think about protein is not just a 24 hour period while important, it is about a meal threshold mm -hmm. that is yet to be reflected in the current recommendations. It is a huge blind spot. Clearly. If we correct for that, then we can protect skeletal muscle. If we protect skeletal muscle, it loops back to correcting the paradigm of thinking. How do they do that? They optimize for protein. They understand dietary protein is a meal threshold. Mm. And now we've just solved many, many problems. Um, perfect kind of revisitation of everything there. Thank you. And it makes me think of another concept um, that I think is very unfortunate when we look at the human experience to kind of bring it home in my own way. 
is oftentimes, I'm sure you can relate working in geriatrics, is when we're with end of life. Why is such a focus at end of life on all of these things that we're now talking about? When a body is in its end of days, what are we trying to do? We're trying to just keep it as strong and homeostatic as possible. Mm -hmm. We're trying to keep adequate protein pumping in. I remember my father passed away from ALS. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're kind of, you're in a losing game there. There's no, like, it's just biding your time until your time's up. But unfortunately during that time, ALS people, my father, you're just literally, your body's just eating away at its muscle, eating away, eating away. Terrible. So you've seen it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I've seen it. And what was being done to just support that was heavy nutrition, direct nutrition focused predominantly around protein. And so if at the end of our life, medical professionals, the medical community is focusing on these things, then why are we not focusing on them now? Because it's hard. That means that the, you know, number one, fat is really easy to focus on. Mm -hmm. You see it, it's homogeneous. Mm -hmm. I used to do the muscle biopsies and the fat, the fat biopsies in the morning at 4 a.m. I wash you, I don't recommend that for anyone. (laughs) Uh, It's easy. Whereas skeletal muscle, it's not. Number one, it's hard to look at. Fiber types are different. It's hard to test for right now. DEXA, Mm. DEXA, it really focuses on fat Mm -hmm. and then it just estimates everything else. Right, yeah. So we have CT, MRI and ultrasound, which they're all difficult Mm -hmm. things to do. We have ways in which we, you know, recommend your, your, you know, your BMI, but we don't know Mm -hmm. what optimal skeletal muscle mass is yet. How is that possible? Yeah, Yeah, they're going to start doing appendicular lean mass index, but we're far away from having enough data Mm -hmm in a way that looks at what an optimal muscle mass should be. We can look at disease states, but we don't necessarily know what optimal is. And just think about the the relationship we can better develop with ourselves. The person who is focused on, I'm too fat, I have too much fat, I'm too big, too soft, versus like, I need to get rid of all this. And like you look what? at the person who yeah. is like, maybe the same person, but different mindset yes. of, I want to work on my muscle mass. Yes. I need to it's bump empowering. this up. I need more. I need more yes. things that just fuel me, feed That's me, right. serve me. That's right. I mean, that is just the whole other behavioral concept that yeah. we need more of, I think, regardless of your health goal. Yeah, I would agree. Well, this is one of those conversations where um, I have just thoroughly been enjoyed being seated here in front of you to just absorb. Um, and I know after we're done here, I'm just going to be, dwelling on this for forever. So this is where I get to say thank you again for just being a wealth of experience and expertise, reminding me of certain things that I have held to be true, but again, giving me some new things to like, all right, Chase, make Dr. Lyon proud. Let's go it's back important. and focus back in on this. It's um, important. And so it, it does bring it all full circle for me, you know, with the aspect of my father and um, just the concept of the show is to just be able to walk away from this with just one thing that we can apply to move forward in life. There are a lot of things that you shared in here, but just one thing that the listener can take home and implement in their life mm-hmm. is going to move them forward, yeah. ever forward. When you hear those two words, what does that mean to you? Which which two? Ever forward. What does uh, that mean to you here today? How do you live a life ever yeah, forward? Yeah, so that's deep commitment. Mm. Deep commitment to whatever your mission is and doing it every day, regardless of the circumstance. Commitment, I think, is a word that we don't think of, or maybe we don't honor enough when we embark on this human experience, our health goals, our wellness goals, whatever. It's a, it's a commitment. Again, it's not the thing. The thing is never the thing. Um, it's just your commitment to yourself, to this change, to this optimization. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and people ask me like, why are you so passionate about this? Well, there's two reasons. And one, I haven't really shared. Hmm. One is my mentor it's been a friendship and a mentorship of 20 years. Wow. 20 wow. years. The Botox is really good. I know. <laughs> um, I thought it was the protein. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's that. And um, he is not accessible to people. Mm. And these concepts are his contribution to science that I have actually seen and implemented in mm. clinical practice. You've been the, the protein champion. And he means everything to me. Mm. And I, he has a legacy in the scientific community and I want to bring his legacy to the public so they can change their lives. Mm. And then the other aspect is it's a sin to know something 
mm. and to not do anything about it. I agree. And I am not the type of person that is okay with having a 17 year education of sacrifice, of commitment, of missing out on everything to drive forward and to not offer that up. Mm. Again, Thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're a military family yeah. and you know, I don't I, know how that goes. Life of service, no matter how you look at it, I yeah. think can't do you wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, of course, we're going to have all your information down in the show notes and video. Uh, where can they go right now to learn more about you and this incredible sure. muscle centric work? Certainly. Um, they can uh, find me on my website, mm -hmm. Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. If they're interested in being a patient, they can apply. If they are military, if they're a special mm -hmm. operator, a portion of my practice is dedicated to special operations particular seals, which it um, turns out half of the veterans I know are your patients or work with you. They something. can contact me. Yeah. So we, we uh, take care of those mm. guys. Um, and they can find me on Instagram, mm. uh, YouTube. I have a, a show, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons show that'll be launching in the next week, which is That's right, yeah. super pumped about. Um, I didn't think I missed. I have a newsletter, which is all information based on yeah, all the, all the normal channels, Twitter, whatever. Well, I mean, you know your stuff and you're passionate about it and you've lived it. And to hear also that you were a vegetarian for so long, mm -hmm. like it's just, I think it's just incredible. You've yeah. got both sides of the coin here to kind of share. Um, yeah. So thank you for being human uh, and sharing your human experiences, but also really shining a light on some scientific areas maybe that, you know, I, the listener, the viewer can really go double down on. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.